anytime I think of a Tesla, I try in my mind to remind myself about the Ford F-150 pickup truck. It's the best-selling car in, in history, year after year after year. It's not a car, but it's technically kind of a car. It's a great truck. So, so like, don't talk to me about Teslas without talking to me about Ford, Ford F-150 pickup trucks, too. So I'm like this bummer, you know? I just kind of... Pe- people call me, you know, all those things. I don't well, know. Why? Because you're just... Because you're so... Obs- because you're describing the wickedness of the problem. Someone has to do it. Hello, and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. So I'm going to do something in this episode that I almost certainly shouldn't do. Uh, particularly in this intro. Um, in fact, even as I think about doing it right now, I'm telling myself that maybe this is a terrible idea, but um, Tiffany Champion's giving me side eye. But um, I, I'm i going to try to do it anyway because it, it sets important context for the conversation we're going to have today. So a little while ago, um, I retweeted an uh, article about just some of the crazy climate chaos that's been happening this summer. I mean, specifically, there were wildfires in Greece that were driving people to jump into the sea to escape them, and there were there were a lot of deaths there. And I retweeted it and I said um, something like, the crisis continues, it's coming for all of us. And someone that I follow on Twitter and really like, a writer that I really like, um, said something like, it would be nice if the television news would tell us about this. And I got a little defensive, I will admit. Um, because I work in television news <laughs> and have a little bit of a complex, I think, like a guilt, frankly, like a guilty complex about um, how much we do or don't cover climate. And I responded and basically said, look, when we have done it, when we do do climate, it is a palpable ratings killer. And so the incentives aren't great. This caused like a mini uproar. I wouldn't call it a full fledged uproar. It was like an uproar let. There was like a little, there was like clickbaity articles about it. People were angry at me. I think there's a little bit of breaking the fourth wall when you invoke ratings or you talk about that, and I understand why that frustrates people. I think one response is like, look, your job is to be a journalist and cover the news and not just chase ratings, and that's true. It's also true that attention, where attention flows in the current news economy, creates a set of incentives. And that's not even just true of like commercial media or corporate media, which I think people really fixated on. Like Attention flows in ways that are often outside the control of those of us working to get people's attention. So we can do a show and we can do topics on the show that people will turn away from. <laughs> I'm telling you, they will. Like, And sometimes those are important topics, and a lot of times you just have to do them anyway. And when it comes to climate, we do climate probably more than anyone on cable news, I'd say. We were nominated for Emmy last year for climate special we did in various parts of the U.S. that are experiencing frontline climate change. We spent a week in California two summers ago just looking at the drought every night at, you know, great expense. That week did not rate that well. I just, (laughs) just to be clear, like it did not rate that well. Like people, it just didn't. We did it anyway. But this is part of a broader set of problems. I mean, one is just the general issue you face if you're working in the media today, which is the competition for eyeballs and the competition for attention. And people use terms like, you know, tabloid or clickbait. If it bleeds, it leads, which is the sort of old cliche about the evening news. But you're fighting for people's attention and certain topics do grab people's attention more than others. And you kind of got to wrestle with that as you think about what you're doing on air. It's just a fact of doing this. Again, doesn't relieve anyone of their journalistic responsibilities to cover the news, but it is a factor. It structures incentives for everyone who's operating in that universe, and I'm one of those people. But the other thing is particular to climate, which is that climate is a particularly difficult problem. It's like this particular problem that has a bunch of attributes that are almost as if you designed a problem to invade us in all our weak spots. It would be this problem. Like, you can't see it is one. You can't see it. You can't see the climate problem. You can't see the climate. You can't see CO2. Even literally, even if CO2 was just a color or you could see it, we would be dealing with much more. You see this happen in all these different countries. They, As soon as they get a certain amount of development and they start getting a ton of smog, they start dealing with the smog. <laughs> like, it just, because it, it shows up and people feel it in their lungs and the, 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 the stimulus and the response are there and you see society start to deal with it. So you can't see it. It's a collective action problem, right? The U.S. could literally zero out all of the carbon that it 
emits, and that would help a little bit, but we can't do it alone. If everyone else emits twice as much, then that just gets erased. So everyone's got to do it together. Collective action problems are really hard, particularly a collective action problem that's global. Like, we have one atmosphere, and we've got 200 countries, <laughs> all governed in all sorts of crazy ways. It's also a problem with these crazy long time spans. So you, you pump the carbon in the atmosphere for 10, 20, 30 years, and then you got to come up with a way to reduce carbon emissions, maybe even take some of the atmosphere for 10, 20 years, and the results come slowly. The disastrous consequences build up over long periods of time. So you've got this crazy time scale. You've got this global collective action problem. You've got the invisibility of it. It's like all of the things that we use to think about how we're going to respond to a problem. Like we have lots of plane crashes. We see the plane crashes. We cover the plane crashes. Then we pass regulation to increase air safety. And we've done a really good job of that. That's like air traffic. Air safety is a great example of like when I was growing up, we had tons of air fatalities. It got a lot of attention. They were very crystal clear that there was a problem. And we did a lot, both on the commercial side with the airlines and regulatory to solve that. And then on top of that, on top of the ways in which the problem exploits some of our social human weaknesses, the problem is caused by a set of wildly powerful and rich interests. <laughs> which is the industry that takes the fossil fuel out of the ground and burns it is one of the most powerful, wealthy interests in the entire world. There are entire countries they effectively run. Uh, they have billions and billions of dollars. The most profitable companies in the U.S. year after year tend to be oil companies, particularly when things are going well for them. So you, you, got, you got all these ways in which the problem itself already is a confounding and difficult and wicked one. And then on top of that, there's the political economy of the problem, which is that a small group of massively, massively wealthy and powerful interests are the ones making the money off making the problem worse and are going to do everything they can to stop us from solving it. Because the physics of climate are clear. Like we know all that's clear. We know what we're doing to the climate. We know why we're doing it because we're burning fossil fuels. And we know that it's going to make the earth warmer. What that warmer earth will look like how warm we'll get, those are all uncertain. But the basic physics are just clear as day. The mystery is why we won't do anything about it. And unlocking the mystery why we won't do anything about it so that we can do something about it. And so in the midst of the fallout from this, uh, you know, micro-controversy, what did I call it before? A, a uproarlet. <laughs> micro-controversy, uproarlet. Um, that the in the midst of this, uh, I got an email from a guy by the name of Andy Revkin. Andy Revkin, if you ever read climate or environmental reporting, is a legend. Um, maybe, maybe the most legendary climate reporter. He's been reporting on climate for three decades at various outlets. He was a New York Times reporter for a very long period of time. He's written multiple books on climate. Um, he he's been there. He wrote a cover story back in 1988 for Discover magazine about climate, and he's been following it since then, and he covered it for the New York Times. He's now at the National Geographic Society, and he reached out to me to say, hey, I thought it was sort of an interesting exchange you had um, on Twitter about the kind of challenges of drawing attention, keeping people's attention on climate and how to talk about it. And, uh, and I said, you know, I would love for you to come on the podcast uh, and talk about it. So he came down. He brought with him some artifacts uh, that you will you you will hear us describe. Um, we also talk about a ton of different articles and, and pieces of writing, all of which we link on our website, which is nbcnews.com slash why is this happening. But I think Andy Revkin, you know, it's so important. We are now <laughs> we are now in the period of climate change that there's a history to the scope of fighting it. Right? We've been, this is, the warning has been there now for over 30 years. Serious conversations about combating it have been around for 30 years. And so Andy is in a really unique position to talk about how over the course of the 30 years that he has spent covering this problem, he has reached deeper and deeper levels of understanding about just how wicked a problem it is. So it's summer. Yeah. 
You know, there's this funny thing about this like weather climate slippage, right? Because the obviously people who are denialists, which again, I actually think is kind of a shrinking rump. Like I don't even think it's a worthwhile group of people to talk about. To me, it, it's a shrinking rump caucus of people. Would you agree with that? Well, I put caution signs around the word denial in some ways because everyone's in denial in one, one aspect of the story or another. And I'm that's not going to go. That's interesting. I'm not going to get into false equivalence arguments about who's in more denial, you know, and people who are motivated denialists. Right. Uh, I call them pe- certain people stasists, hmm. people who want to maintain the status quo and who have some have a professional interest in maintaining the status quo, but, you know, lobbyists uh, for oil companies and coal. So that's one thing, but a d- denial is different. Denial has this I- this sense of like it's partially conscious, you know. I you're in denial. Yeah, well, I'm in think, denial about the fact that I'm going to die someday. You know, well, that, I don't think about it. Every day. I mean, hopefully, I mean that's be basically my lifelong quest is to be in denial about that as much as possible. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what's that basically that's yeah. the recipe for human happiness for me. Yeah. So so setting <laughs> aside, so, if I don't work enough and I don't occupy yeah. myself, then like that reality just creeps into my consciousness, and then I'm bummed out. Yeah. Like I wrote this piece where I called myself a recovering denialist because I assumed the first 20 years of my writing about global warming, like any science writer writing about science, I assumed if I enlighten you, you will then feel the way I do about the thing <laughs> and change your practice, change your- I'm laughing and, because that's such a, it's such a rational way to think about it, but so untethered from actual oh reality. Yeah, but it 20 20 years. It took me uh. like, you know, 1988, my first cover story <laughs> on global warming. And um, and it took I, you twenty years. You thought like I need to take a pickaxe to this rock of ignorance and just chip away at it, and eventually, uh, uh, I chip away from it. It will be clear, and then we will on the other side will be. Oh yeah, and that and, and cool graphics and stuff. You know, I started in in, in magazines. So this is my art. This is an artifact, like from my little museum. And Andy Revkin is currently holding up a Discover magazine right. with the title "The Greenhouse Effect and the Earth Melting into a Puddle." That is from when. October 1988. You know that because at the top, the top line drop is exclusive interview, <laughs> colon, Dukakis on science. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that says a lot right there. Um, so, you know, it has all these cool graphics. We have, a, we had a real, we had a graphic that a, a, um, a California climate scientist recently tweeted about because it's like what they've been saying all this time. It's, it's the uh, snowpack issue in California. If the winters get warm enough, you have less snow. It comes down as rain. They don't have the reservoirs to capture the rain. Right. Big, big. You'll get droughts. So we had that in 1988. You know, we had uh, we had heat, obviously, <laughs> you know, more 100 degree days, and we had sea level rise, and we had a farmer kicking his field. It was a record drought and wow. heat that summer. And what here's now that's what, 1988. Really, yeah. So and then the kicker, yeah. I love this. The, here's the visual kicker: as a farmer in his field kicking the dust. But the kicker in the story. By the way, I'm glad that you recognize this as a visual medium. Yeah. And you're really leaning into that. You mean the medium that we're <laughs> yes, speaking of? No, I'm describing it. The sun is showing me. The sun is heading toward the horizon. A farmer in his field is silhouetted, and there's dust where his boot is hitting his 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 um, ruined crop. And but the kicker, the written kicker on this was, this always haunts me because it's like this is the Groundhog Day aspect of my life. Michael McElroy, he's still at Harvard. He was at Harvard then, climate guy. He concluded, if we choose to take on this challenge, it appears that we can slow the rate of change substantially, giving us time to develop mechanisms so that the cost to society and the damage to ecosystems can be minimized. We could alternatively close our eyes, hope for the best, and pay the cost when the bill comes due. 1988. How many times have you heard a speech since 1988, whether it's Al Gore or a scientist uh, saying the same thing? Well, okay, that though, so that gets to part of the issue with the the meta issue of how you think about process, draw attention to, publicly reason about this issue. There's a clarity to the problem. Like we know what the problem is. The physics were developed back in the 19th century. Like just that, that, that part of it's clear. And we know we need to reduce the amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere. But you spent 20 years pointing out those basic things, yeah. right, and the effects of it. What did you learn in those 20 years? Like when you say that you were in denial, what did, what were you in denial of and what did you learn? Well, I, you know, I won awards and then in 1992 I wrote a book that accompanied the first big museum exhibition on global warming, the Museum of Natural History. And, uh, you know, Al Gore was there and uh, actually Charlton Heston was there. It was this weird big party, you know. And in 1992, and so I was on a roll, you know, I was kind of like doing the 
that cool thing that environmental journalists get to do when you're riding this wave. And what I hadn't really kept track of was the data on what people think and do. Clinton Gore, White House through the 90s, did hardly anything on this. Uh, oil prices were low. Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines had erupted, which kind of cools the climate. So right. and we had this thing called the Gulf War, you know, the distraction issue. And, and so it like it was asleep, and I, I was asleep. But then th what happened was 2006, the issue got so polarized that a Weekend Review editor said to me, hey, Andy, why is everyone freaking out about it? Why is there this big fight going on? And so I did this piece that was a front of the Weekend Review section of the Times called Yelling Fire on a Hot Planet. And it was the first time, so 1988 to 2006, that was the first time I interviewed a social scientist about climate change. Hmm. First time. And, and Helen Ingram at UC Irvine, who was um, in that arena of social and political science, she said to me, and there's a quote in that story, you know, things that people vote on are things that are soon, salient, and certain. Hmm. And that kind of is reverberating in my head as I'm thinking about climate change, which has this endless feeling of it's just over the horizon. And I did a piece in, I had done a piece in the year 2000 called Global Waffling. <laughs> when are we gonna like have that moment that everyone keeps looking for? And so having had those, that kind of experience doing reporting where I was really trying to figure out why there was such stasis and then having social scientists for the first time telling me, well, well you don't know. And then this is when I interviewed psychologists and you know, behavioral scientists who was a whole new body of science. Here I am a science journalist. I've won these science awards for my environmental coverage, but this was the first time I got into that science, peer-reviewed work, showing you that most of the time, information actually doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, cultural cognition is this important line of work a guy at Yale, Dan Kahane, has been doing for a long time. And, and that work was particularly devastating to a journalist because it, his work basically says, um, more science literacy is not an indicator of your position on a polarized issue like global warming. No, and in fact, one of the things we know, which is one of the most interesting pieces of data on this, is that um, more educated Republicans are more denialist yeah. and worse on the facts of climate than less educated Republicans. And that's because they bring their education and their erudition and their reading to the cognitive task of post hoc rationalizations for what the tribal belief is. Absolutely. There's great evolutionary value in, in adherence to your tribe. You go back through human history. So basically, it's logical, rational, smart mm -hmm. to put your tribe above your, your data. This happens on every side of these issues. And it's vaccines, global warming, evolution. Once right. an issue has the, those components, abortion, Middle East policy, you know, there's these certain issues that get people into that mode. Where you, and, and then when you think about it in an evolutionary sense or cultural evolution, you realize you, you go back to our, our origins on the, uh, the African plains. I mean, do you want to be the hunter who goes off into the wilderness and comes back and says, you know, I really, I don't believe in our God anymore. I saw this really interesting thing. Or do you want to be the one who says, hey, hi guys. I, right. Yeah, I saw something interesting. Bye. Let's, let's have dinner. So it's like, it's actually purely rational. Okay, but that so what I'm hearing from you is sort of a, a turn your work from the from from thinking about this, conceiving of this as a physical problem of the physical world, physical science, to being a to, to being a problem of social science, right? And I've seen this a lot of the people that cover this issue, right? Because it's at a certain point, it's like there's a lot of interesting, complicated things about what's happening vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the physics of the climate and the modeling and stuff we don't know, and we're still figuring out what it does to hurricanes because it might make them less frequent but more strong and it's a very complicated dynamic system yeah. but the basic yeah. physics we know the black box mystery is why can't we get humans to do what they need to do about it right yeah. and you're you're saying that your turn in work was like it was the trajectory of 20 years of talking about the physics to talking about the humans yeah although there's another element so it, and this is this is my learning curve going in one direction hitting a wall recalibrating going in another direction hitting a wall recalibrating and the other wall was learning more and more about energy history and about the profundity of our relationship to abundant energy. There's a guy named Dan Botkin who's an ecologist. He wrote sometime in that stretch about democracy and energy. Yeah. You only really get a flourishing society when you have too much energy to even think about. So it's like abundant arts, culture. There's some weird aspects to this because he wrote that, you know, like ancient Greece and Rome, they had abundant energy. It was slaves. Right. So this wasn't like freedom and wonder for the slaves who were carting ice from the, the mountains so they could have air conditioning in their houses in Rome. 
but for the for those in the society, it was like cool, great. So so we absolutely care about energy more than we do about climate, and the the climate is a backloaded issue, right? And energy is a front loaded issue. You need it right now, and if the air conditioning sitting, died yeah. in this building, we'd all be freaking out. And if you're poor, it's even more primal because it's everything to you. I spent time last year in India, you know, in households where they cook on wood and dung, and and no one wants to be cooking on wood and dung. So you had the psychology. You also have this profound reality that progress is basically built on abundant energy. And the source that's abundant right now is fossil fuels. The impacts of that are long-term, not short-term. And there's another factor, uncertainty. The thing that I had been writing about a lot and got me hammered also by sort of climate progressives was that one of the things we know profoundly about climate change, one of the most profoundly understood things about climate change is the things we powerfully don't know. Right. Like how hot it's gonna get, pretty basic question. And um, how fast is sea level gonna rise? Still about the same uncertainty as it was in 1988. And you can paint that over, but it's real. And it's, and that, can be, that, that gets exploited by everybody. Sure, you know? but meaning that we know, I mean, we know the direction, right? It's gonna yeah. get hotter and the sea level is gonna come up. But it's not gonna get colder unless there's a, you know, a volcanic eruption. Right, and all right. It's gonna get, over time, it's gonna get hotter, sea level is gonna come up. The big questions are how quickly those changes happen and what second order, third order dynamic effects they have on the most complex dynamic system on the earth, which is yeah. the Earth's climate. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we still it's just like a that's just a tough question to answer. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting when I look back at my early stuff, the, this article, I wrote a book in 1992. I brought it again as like a collector's item for you. to. I might. I, you can get these now on, on um, Amazon used for like uh, free, actually. It's like you know, free <laughs> plus shipping. Shipping is about four dollars. You can get my global warming, understanding the forecast. I get not a penny out of this. I can talk about it without promotional. Uh, you can see I have like look my hairdo back then. Is I have a what Wait, do you call it? A, 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 a mullet. A mullet. Yeah, yeah really this big is mullet. Andy, this is a, I'm looking at this picture again because it's a visual <laughs> medium. Look at a picture of Andy Revkin with a mullet and a baby on his back in one of those like neat hiking backpacks, standing on a cliff overlooking <laughs> some uh, some water. That was in the Pacific Ocean. Yet, yeah, and that baby is now 28 years old and working in Hollywood. There you go. So anyway. And the earth is still warming. And Al Gore is on the back cover as Senator Al Gore. That was just before he uh, got And Bill Reynos. McKibben, who's yeah, of course. still in the fight. Of course. So you, you have uncertainty, which can then be used as a tool for delay. And you have, and it's real. It's like you, they're not lying about it. And you also have another, there's this other screwed up aspect of the climate problem, which is inertia. And this is something you never hear about from those pursuing aggressive action which is the climate system, as you just said, is huge. It's huge and complicated. And suppose we did that Paris Agreement and just did even twice as good at slowing emissions and reducing them. The climate system won't notice that in a way that you can measure for several decades. Sea level and fires and whatever, whatever's happening in the climate now doesn't immediately go, hey, right. cool. All the carbon's there. Yeah, so, and the momentum, you know, the heat right. in the ocean, and if you're, you know, really, pursuing this aggressively, you kind of paint that over, it's a problem. So to the point about why it's hard, why it's a yeah. hard human problem, which I think is the thing that we're talking about, right? Your sort of discovery over the 20 years and something that I kind of deal with every day and sort of how to program a news show that's going to sure. get people's attention. You know, when you think about when you go to the elevator, I'm the kind of person that presses the button four times or like watches someone <laughs> press it and then presses it because it's like... I just need the feedback. Like I'm, right. I'm antsy and I'm impatient, and sure. like people will tell you, like Tiffany's here smiling, like in segment meetings, and like it's just like I want to go to the next thing. Like that's how I, yeah. I want to like I'm, I don't like futzing around. I want to do the next thing, and that's just the kind of person I am. And there's a satisfaction in action, reaction, yeah. <laughs> stimulus, response. There's a reason that the people that design elevators design an elevator so that the button lights up when you press it. And if they don't design it so the button lights up and you press it, you press it and you keep pressing it, right? And yeah. it's like this huge complex dynamic system that's invisible, carbon yeah. can't be seen, and there's no light on the elevator button. So it's like even if you start doing the right thing, you're not yeah. getting the response from the system. And so then it's really hard to go around and be like, we did it, guys. Good work. Yeah. Let's do more of this. And that's the sort of thing that you were able to do with, say, CFCs, right? Oh, yeah. Like in the so Montreal weird. Protocol, which is which got basically got rid of chlorofluorocarbons, yeah. which is a great victory, a great environmental collective action thing where we said, we're yeah. going to ban these chlorofluorocarbons. They're putting a hole in the ozone layer. 
I bet you there's that was like all the rage back in 1988. You're thumbing oh, through well, Discover it's magazine. Even more so. No, it, well, my, no, <laughs> the it was ozone worse layer than was the thing, dude. Like we were I was, totally. elementary school. It's like the ozone layer. I was like, I was like a freaked out, anxious nine year old worrying right. about the ozone layer. Like, what the hell's going to happen to the ozone layer? And it's yeah. like we actually solved that problem. But part of the thing that happened was the stimulus response there was so direct. Well, th- there's several th- really cool things. I just. I just was at this rollout thing they had at the New York Times for um, Nathaniel Rich's epic 30,000-word um, magazine-filling yep. story. Which is a piece about sort of this 10-year window, a decade that, that he sort of says we almost got our act together and then missed the window, and it became this polarized issue. Right, and I d- dispute that. Uh, Twitter, yeah. I disputed it on Twitter, and last night I asked a gentle question about it. I like the piece has amazing granular detail on some of these moments that, to my, to my eye, illustrate this wicked nature of the problem. Like, in there was some meeting in 1980 at a hotel in St. Petersburg, Florida, the Pink Palace, where I guess it was like a dozen really smart policy people got in a room. The Congress wanted them to draft legislation on climate. They couldn't come up with one sentence, which gets at this problem with the problem, you know. So it has lots of that great stuff, but it had this premise, which is there was this magical moment. Well, and part of that was... We did it with CFCs. 1987, so just the year before this, was the Montreal Protocol. And it was a great achievement. And it is. We are seeing slowly this bruise in the atmosphere is starting to heal. And so you think, oh, wow. So this is like a revolution because we had a long-term problem. Most of the impact risks are for in the future. And we did it, you know. But what was missed in his story, and I was at, there's a scene in his story at this Toronto meeting on the changing atmosphere, which is a week after the testimony by Jim Hansen, the NASA scientist that really put this issue in the news in a big way for the first time. At that meeting, this guy, Peter Winsemius, this Dutch guy, I asked him, you know, well, so CFCs, right? And he kind of said, well, he said, you know, with CFCs, with these chlorofluorocarbons, these refrigerants, you could get the... CEOs of the comp- all the companies in the world that made them into one room. There are 38. Think about that in the context of climate change. Right, CO2. Right. CO2 is not like CFCs. And it was a tiny part of our economy. You know, refrigerants, and there were already substitutes. Right. Industry had already had substitutes. This issue was on the books for 10 years, since the 70s. So it was really a minor blip. And then you compare that to carbon dioxide, which is a a proxy for progress, essentially. So this idea that that was a magical turning point, it's just, it misses the reality that, no, it's just as the thing that didn't happen yet at that point, 1988, was China, for example, didn't become the modern China. While we were watch, while we were at this event at the Times, I was uh, Googling for um, China's GDP. It was $350 billion a year in 1988. It's 11 trillion now, 30, 35 times over. Right. And that was all from burning coal to bring people out of poverty. Right. And that was another thing that was in my piece in 1988. I had this section on China. Who are we to limit China's, in 1988, who are we to limit China's right to grow using coal? And I'm kind of proud of the fact that it was in there. And I didn't really like fully absorb those realities yet at that time. I still was on that kind of magical mystery tour, environmental progress kind of guy. Because the issue, as it became more and more wicked, the other thing that happened, I realized what a bad fit it is for the news process. It, yeah, let's talk just, about this. You know, it's, and I, the, it's so bad for the news process. It's like the worst possible yeah. thing. It's like the it's like the national. It's, it's another like part national of the wicked, wickedness of the problem. Yeah, which is yeah. that it's oh, yeah. Yeah, although national debt, people talk. I mean, people talk about no, no one. No one actually cares about it. It's like national debt yeah. is like this weird bad faith thing that's marshaled yeah. as a sort of weaponized. Oh, totally. And there's point. And, and you know. The scale of the climate problem is so much more profound than that scale. Of course, because you can't move because atoms versus dollars. Exactly. Dollars can be moved. I can move dollars instantaneously. Right now, I can move money from one account to another account. I cannot move carbon molecules from (laughs) this part of the atmosphere to that part of the atmosphere. Can't do it. Like That's a physics problem, not an accounting one. Accounting problems can be solved very quickly. There are, there are scientists trying to work on ways to get those molecules out of the atmosphere, well, but they run, like, they run up against, so we got uncertainty, we got momentum, we got all these issues, right? Scale. The scale. word scale, it's become to me this marker. You know, there's certain things I listen for when someone emails me or calls me, hey, I've got the solution. Scale is the first word that comes to mind. I'm like, okay, let's talk scale about scale, this? right? Yeah. Even with uh, Teslas, anytime I think of a Tesla, I try in my mind to remind myself about the Ford mm-hmm. F-150 pickup truck. It's the best-selling car in, in history, year after year after year. It's not a car, but it's technically kind of a car. It's a great truck. 
Yeah, and they're it's right. great truck. And we just started exporting them to China last year. The uh, the Raptor, I think it's called. Al is nodding his head. Yeah, see, it's a great truck. Yeah. So so like, don't talk to me about Teslas without talking to me about Ford, Ford F one fifty pickup trucks too. So I'm like this bummer, you know. I just kind of pe- people call me, you know, all those things. What about us, etc. Well, why? Because you're just because you're so obs- because you're describing the wickedness of the problem. Someone has to do it. Right, but like I don't know, man. Why why does it feel you know, when you talk about the newsroom thing, like I would say that we probably have covered climate more than anyone on click cable news, I think it would be fair to say. But it's still a laughably insufficient ratio to the magnitude of the problem. And that's because particularly for a daily news show where you have to show stuff, like it's a tough thing to cover in a daily cable news show, right? And it's like true, there's wildfires and the weather events and we make sure when we do cover those weather events we talk about the fact that the yeah. climate is altering the dynamic system out of which those weather events emanate. We talked about it during Irma. We did a week on the California drought where we went out to California. We do all those things. Right. You know, we covered the withdrawal from Paris on the day the withdrawal from Paris happened. But again, it, the, there's this disconnect that I feel in me, which is this. If you said to me, write down the single most important problem in the world right now, the one that if you can wave a magic wand, you would solve, I th- I'm pretty sure it would be climate. If you said... Okay, now tell me what are the things that you get really excited about thinking about and writing about and what what kind of articles do you gravitate towards and read and what are the podcasts you listen to? Like I would get to a bunch of stuff before I got to climate. <laughs> I just would. Like it's like it's just not, you know, I'm I'm talking in a totally kind of weird like aesthetic visceral way. Like there's certain things like I'm really into criminal justice stuff and I read a lot about it and I like seek it out and I'm really into like history of reconstruction or world oh, war yeah. one or like the weird like there's all sorts of things that i just like i'm interested in because people have different interests like some people like pottery and <laughs> some people like tennis and and that is just a thing that like i have to push myself to do out of this sort of place of duty and the problem with that is you can't sell dutiful no well like, the other that to me yeah. is the big obstacle here am i wrong you can't sell dutiful. Well, yes. Um, this crystallized in that same year I was talking about, uh, 2006, when I wrote that Yelling Fire piece. That was the year Time Magazine had um, a cover written by a friend of mine, Jeff Kluger. Uh, the headline was, Be Worried, Be Very Worried. And it had a polar bear like looking down at the water. Right, from, yeah, classic. And, and, and that's, that was, I think I cited it in my story. It's like, that was, this, you know, I talked to psychologists. And they say you can't impose worry on people. Hello, right, right. we know that you can give them the information, and it builds within, and they can become but worried. Now, okay, but then the problem with that is there's this crazy David Roberts. I thought had a great thread about this, and David is he's a friend. He's a you know someone that I've known forever, talked to about this era. He writes for, for Vox, and I love what yeah. he writes. But you know, he had this great thread where it's like there's this overcorrection in the climate community, which is like. Okay, we now know what all the sort of the cultural cognition and the social science says, and you can't freak people out, and you can't worry them, and you can't be too this, and you can't be too this, and this is the recipe, so do it like this, but then say, like, this is a threat, but we can still solve it, and everybody has a happy ending, and yada, yada. And it's like, well, that's just paint-by-numbers, boring, dutiful as well. Right, and I've seen this many times, and I, I'm a little sad about the character of climate journalism these days. The great thing is, in 1988, 1990, right through 95, whatever, there was like three of us doing it, and now there's hundreds. And you would think that's great, but I do say, you know, I'll speak a little bit like a gray beard curmudgeon. I think I have that. I've earned that, <laughs> whether it's a good thing or Your not. Beard isn't that great. You no it longer is, have yeah. a mullet. It's it's. Yeah, I would say it's, <laughs> I'd say it's salt and pepper. It's yeah, okay. it's freckled kind of. It is freckled. Yeah. yeah, there's a very surfacey aspect of what's coming out, and people don't examine the basic things that a journalist should ask when anything is happening, whether it's fires in Greece or California, or a bomb exploded somewhere. It really takes me back to journalism school, 1982. You know, what happened? What do I know? Not just quoting people, you know, getting behind what people are saying, including environmentalists, including people you think are well-meaning, and saying, well, what do we know? When was the last time um, Puerto Rico got hit by a bad hurricane? What do we know about the long history of hurricanes in that part of the Caribbean? And this is this other body of science that's really been sobering for me. It's uh, paleoclimatology. This is seabed sediment and tree rings, and you can get information about past activity. And it turns out that, and it's very impolitic to even say it, but I wrote a story in the Times in 2007 about a really important study by a guy named Jeff Donnelly at Woods Hole. Hurricanes more intense in Caribbean and past cooler climates. I mean, it's a fact. It yeah. is a fact. And I guess the study was based on cores drilled in Vieques right there in Puerto Rico. So 
there's huge problems related to Puerto Rico, the vulnerability that was there. Yeah. Through, through all the things we all know about poverty and, and inadequate governance and investment and all, is horrific. And it was a tragedy. But it, climate change is not what the tragedy was about. It was about vulnerability. Even the ecology of Puerto Rico is, is an ecology of disruption. Right. The plants right. there show that. So it's like, how do you get that thought into a front page or like an Insta story and you know on right. a website? But even worse than that is if you're not looking at least to answer those basic questions. Right. And, but, and yet at the same time, there is the fact that like it just does get hotter every year. Yeah, with all the variations. <laughs> I mean, with are, all the variations. You know, but yeah, like, we, but like oh, yeah. you know, you chart it out and it's like amidst all the noise, there's yeah. a signal and the signal's very clear. And like, you know, right now we're going to set a bunch of records. Like when you, my favorite is like when you look at record highs versus record lows, because that does a really good job of, it does. of yeah. showing it. And it's like the record highs are, you know, four to one over record lows or whatever it is. I'm, I'm yeah. pulling that out of thin air, but you could chart these and it's like, it gets hotter every year. And like. That's having very significant effects, and we're seeing it in all sorts of crazy ecosystem ways of when plants flower and when things germinate, and farmers yeah, sure. can tell you this. And, and, and when forests get past that threshold of heat and dryness where they ignite. Yeah, right. At some level, I think the difference between 88 and, and 2018 is that it is more tangible. It really is. Yeah, it, it is, especially in heat, hotter heat waves. is like a, pretty much a, a shoe in. Many other things are not. And then this is this other. So we got, I don't even, I can't keep the list going. Uncertainty, uh, momentum. The other one is the other things that are in motion. And this is the one that I hadn't really appreciated until 2010, probably, which is where we build and how we build is, is the thing that's most profoundly increasing vulnerability to hazards in the climate system. I know you did all that work on Sandy. Mm-hmm. There's several elements of the Sandy experience there is a signal of climate change in there. And we know rising seas will make yep. the next Sandy worse. Absolutely, yep. like yep. way worse. But in 1822 or three, there was this devastating hurricane that made Manhattan into two islands. That whole area, Canal Street, you know, the swampy yep. part yep. was gone for a while. There's this team of geographers, these two guys whose work is so great. Um, it's worth people Googling for. It's just search for the phrase expanding bullseye. And they are measuring growth in zones where there are bad things that happen. Right. Uh, more Oklahoma tornado. They did one in Houston. They do this in uh, fire zones. You know, this science of attribution, some aspect of that fire is likely global warming. If you include, well, what aspect of the fires in California is about where people have built in the last 40 years that they didn't build 40 years ago? That is- The biggest. It is the thing. Yeah. And I've written about that over and over and over again. But this is another one of these that's cases re- that's where- That's really true. That is really true in, in Houston flooding where- um, Same if thing. you if you yeah. hold the climate constant, the the way that they're building Houston is producing is going to produce more floods, even if the con- yeah. if the, the climate system wasn't changing at all. All these boring words like impervious surface, yeah, right, yeah. right, which channels all that water that might sink into the ground otherwise. But in California, it's it's worse. I did this thing on Monterey like ten years ago. The fire hazard map for Monterey Peninsula, that whole area was bright red, and that's hazard. It means danger, danger, danger. Will Robinson stuff. Then you look at building rates, and it, it wasn't accounted for Colorado the, but that's uh, it's just that what you're describing is the same problem that, that climate is right it's this, it's like people need homes now or they need yeah they need heat now or they need electricity now they need these things now these are not you know some of this is you know you're building McMansions that you know people have homes if they don't build them but a lot <clears> of this particularly when you're looking at what's happening in a place like China or a place like India or what's happening in in, in sub-saharan Africa particularly right which has experienced extremely high GDP growth and yeah. real question about what its energy trajectory looks like this is the stuff that makes essentially modern life. Yeah. The building, though, the thing with the building, you know, I'm all for those realities, but a bunch of it is subsidized by That's tax- true. That's taxpayers. True. And that, there's this uh, free market think tank, Headwaters Economics. I started paying attention to their thinking on land use and risk in the West 10 years ago. And in a piece I did on what Obama can do even while we're waiting for, this right. is during the recession. You know, what, what can right. you do during a recession that can make a difference for environmental outcomes. And one was, well, and subs, like- Flood insurance. Wh- yeah, flood insurance. And that, there's a long story there about how we actually did the right thing, but then rolled it back because Democrats and Republicans didn't like their rates rising. The, the, the flood insurance story is amazing because basically American flood insurance works with the federal government subsidized people to build in flood zones. Uh, it, that's the short version of it. Basically, we, we, we take on a risk subsidy by backstopping through a federal flood insurance program to artificially cheapen the cost of building in a flood zone, which, guess what? 
you get more growth in places that flood, and so you get more floods, and so then the flood insurance program keeps needing more and more money and more yeah. bailouts. So they reformed it, and everyone freaked out because the premiums went up, and then they unreformed it. <laughs> because, oh, because people were like, "Well, wait a second! You, you my flood insurance went up. It's like, yeah, right. We, we and, we're now we got we took away the subsidy that was artificially lowering the and that, price, and that made my head explode because it was like, I like to look for a counter. Like, where is the example where we did the right thing, even in a polarized Congress, even under a Democratic president? It, that happened, and then it unraveled. It's like, oh no, and and but no, this is a, these are much harder stories for the media to tell, which is a, a shame. The one thing I have learned. Now that I'm at 30 years in on this story, <laughs> the worst way to think about global warming is to think of, about it as global warming, because it's so disconnected from the yeah. thing, the actions that can actually do something about the thing we care about, which is, you know, we want to have a sustainable relationship with the climate system. That's the thing we want, right? We right. want to know roughly, is it going to rain this summer for the crops? Can we have some predictability about tornadoes and storms? Etc. Well, and, also, can can you go outside in Scottsdale, Arizona, in July? Well, I mean, yeah, that's, or, and, and that's like, I mean, let's be let's be clear. Or Saudi here. Arabia. Like, that's a question. Like the, yeah. the habitability of big parts of developed America yeah. are genuinely on the table by 2060. I was at a meeting recently and spoke for a long time with a Saudi uh, guy, and his theory is, you know, the world's going to be on this issue when the Hajj can't happen anymore. Mm. Because it, even Saudi Arabia doesn't have enough money to put in all the tents and coolers, the things you wow, need. that's a great line. And that's an area that is like ground zero for uninhabitability is the Persian Gulf because of the humidity. It's not just the heat, it's the humidity. And there, it really will. Did you coin that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, um, so when the Hajj, you know, when hundreds of millions of uh, Muslims cannot go to Mecca anymore, then... The, the oil kingdoms will act differently. Um, yeah, but then they'll just be mashing the controller and pressing the elevator button. I mean, well, th that's yeah. the point, right? Like, yeah. uh, unless we unless we get unless we figure out how to take carbon out of the atmosphere, which I increasingly think is going to have to be part of the solution, right? Although that takes time too. You know, it's like we're we're in the you know we're in the we're, I don't know if I can say the s word. <laughs> yeah, of course you can. We're in the shit. You know, it this it's not going to be the end. It's not end times. But it's going to be bad. Yeah, I mean... It's I, already going to be bad. The, the fourth book I wrote, the new one, is the history of our relationship with weather and climate. It's how do you end a book about the history of our relationship with weather and climate. It's about the climate of the year 100,000 years from now. And we're already, we're already at that. We are shaping the climate of this planet now for the next 100,000 years. It's, it's like this pulse of carbon is enough. How quickly sea levels rise, how much temperatures rise... Whether it'll fend off the next ice age, which is what that item is about, which is likely that we've actually, we won't have another ice age until we decide to, essentially. So we're at it on this giant scale that's so far beyond our comprehension and certainly beyond our policy instruments that it, it leads you, it le has led me to a completely different way of thinking about global warming. The, the big thing. And then what do you do about it? Which is a bunch of little things. The big thing is more like... Um, you know, how many times have the, has there been a war on X, like mm -hmm. war on poverty, war on, war on cancer? Right. Uh, Bill McKibben in 2016 proposed a war on climate change. You know, and, I, and Bill and I go back way back, right yeah. to the beginning, and we're friends. You blurbed your book where you have yeah, them all. Yeah, we have very different prescriptions and ideas about what we do. And I say it's fine to call it a war, but remember, it's that kind of war. It's a multi-generational war. We're not going to fix cancer, and we're going to try really hard to fix poverty for the rest of time, probably. All these things we think of as institutional, long-standing things. The EPA was 1970-ish. The um, Energy Department was late 70s. So there are these new emergent realities that become part of how we act. FEMA, I, I, I was with the FEMA director. I interviewed him on a stage at Aspen at the, that Ideas Festival a few weeks ago. And, well, he said, uh, Brock Long, he said, you know, in this conversation about disasters and stuff, he said, he said if you're waiting for FEMA, you're, you're, you're way late in the game. You got to work on disaster yeah. risk reduction now, right. and that's kind of what I was saying. One of the things you can do right now about climate change, or about climate vulnerability, you know, I think that's the thing. If we just focus on climate vulnerability, getting into arguments about how much of it is global warming is a waste of time, because you're not going to change people's minds, right? By saying it's global warming, they either believe it or or not right now. There's no policy for that. And as I said, there's momentum in the system. So even if you have a perfect climate policy, the climate of Northern California is not going to change magically. 
But you can definitely do things with zoning, with uh, housing, uh, you know, subsidies to start shifting us out of harm's way. So we, we're not keeping expanding the bullseye. That's all actionable right now. But that's, I mean, I, I re, there's a rebellion against that, right? Because it's like, don't have a second mortgage for in red zones and, and change yeah. zoning and, and change our floodplain plans. And I agree with all that. But like, also, if we just continue business as usual, like, we can't keep doing that. Oh, no, no. I, none of what I'm saying is we don't have to work really hard to mitigate emissions right. of greenhouse yeah, gases. Yeah. It, it is that you have to get comfortable with the fact that that's a, that's a long, long process. And I've seen some encouraging signals from people who were, for a very long time, you know, solve the climate crisis as if there's a point, a juncture, right, like right, I talked right. about with Nathaniel Rich's article. Wen Stevenson, a very passionate journalist who got deep into climate activism recently, wrote a piece saying, it, the, the word solution should be banned yeah. from discussions of climate change. And I, I was like, yes, good. I'm glad I'm hearing yeah, it's this. It's a process. It, and it's, um, so we're, we're going forward in an iterative way. You know, the knowledge base is increasing on what can do. The one thing we're not doing, and that gets left out of still of most environmental framed discussions, is boosted research, boosted science on basic energy problems. I was at a meeting and- um, That's a great point. And I wrote about, I did a page one story in the New York Times 2006, that same year, 2006 was like a busy year, declining research and energy in an, in an era of global warming. And it was about this bipartisan slumber party, Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter who's in office, who's in, who had Congress. Uh, after the energy crisis of the 70s, we went to sleep on thinking, and it's really logical to go to sleep. We have a lot of energy, you know? yeah. and now we have more than ever because of fracking, you know, oil and gas. And so it's like, well, how, why should we still boost our energy research budgets? But when you look at it as a portion of all of our pie of things we spend money on, there's this great graph, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, they've kept track of R&D spending on everything since the Sputnik, 1953. That's when federal research started on science, right. basically federal money for science. They freaked out about that. Yeah, and so space race is this, you look at these curves, there's this big yellow wedge that was the space race, getting to the moon and then the shuttle and it got up to about 40 billion a year at the peaks. Um, war on cancer, basically health research, 40 billion a year. Uh, energy has always been this two to three billion dollar a wow. year dribble. And Obama and that, that recession um, stimulus package, it ticked up a little bit. You look at the curve, it's like, bing, there's a little tick up and then bing, it goes away completely and we're back mm -hmm. to slumber mode. And this is before you know Trump got in office. So it's just not a priority. So one of the things that I've come around to believing, and it's maybe a good place to sort of and the discussion is this is, I think, a weird thing to admit because I think it cuts against what my kind of first principles are as a person and as a citizen and as a thinker, uh, which is that like climate change is a political problem. It will be solved through political action and, and collective action. You know, we have come together to solve very hard problems as a political matter before. Um, sometimes it's really brutal. Sometimes it's extremely conflict laden in some cases. As in the problem of slavery, it cost the lives of 600,000 Americans who, f who fought the bloodiest war in the country's history over it. Yeah. But fundamentally, a political problem fundamentally be solved through politics and collective action. I think I don't think that anymore. <laughs> I think what I think is that like there's going to have to just be a technological solution that like basically just be the, because of the wickedness of the problem that the engineer like we just need some engineers to just figure it out, which is in a variety of complex ways, which is like making really good and very cheap and scalable renewable energy, changing grids, coming up with ways to take the carbon out of the atmosphere. That's basically where my hope is now, which is in by no means advocating quietism or end of political action, but that like avoiding real, real disaster is going to involve a very healthy chunk of like brilliant engineers figuring some crazy shit out. And not just engineers, but um, social and behavioral science has to be part of this in terms. Of, and I don't mean it used to be to do that to sell concern right, right. that's that's the big fail and that's a big fail of a lot of journalism too bigger headline scare scary right, stuff right it's to look at how do you foster conversations part of my i'm a national geographic society now that's the grant making part and um, i've been re writing a lot lately about how do you <laughs> how do you find consensus amid all polarization and and you can have consensus on vulnerability reduction absolutely libertarians hate the idea of subsidized flood insurance right so, so that's an area of innovation that's just as important, I think, to, as a better, better, better battery. Because if you can find a way to get libertarians and, and liberals for very different reasons to focus on one of the vulnerability issues related to climate change, you're doing something 
very powerful. And I wrote this piece in National Geographic magazine last in July. That's like an essay looking back at 30 years of learning and unlearning. <laughs> like, and as you said, I went through this. I thought it was political. I thought it was di diplomatic. I thought it was technological. I thought it was all these things. Uh, and I realized, no, it's not that. It's not that. And there, then I realized it's part. It's partially all of those things. It, it's this emergent phenomenon of a species. And I wrote this 10 years ago. I call it puberty on the scale of a planet. Mm. You know, here we are. We're in Zoom mode. Fossil fuels were the Zoom part, you know, and like in a revving up car. When I was a teenager, a friend of mine took me out in his hopped up car. We got up to 125 miles an hour in an unbuilt stretch of highway. And I thought, wow. You know? So that's been us so far. And now there are these signals, you know, which are really like growing up, that transition from puberty mm. to whatever comes next. When you face that kind of transition, the other thing about this issue that seems vital, but maybe it's the hardest thing of all, it's uh, response diversity. Response diversity is necessary when you have a complicated problem. I stumbled on this after a fight with David Roberts during the Keystone fight. Uh, we had different positions and what to do. And I started Googling around for like environment response diversity. Can't we, it was like, can we all get along kind of thing? But well, we all want to solve this climate issue. But there, Jim Hansen is pro-nuclear. You know, Bill McKibben mm -hmm. is pro-renewables. Right. They found a way to tie themselves to the same fences at the White House and not argue with each other about their visions of the solution. But right. most of the community around this issue hasn't figured that out yet. And so one of the challenges, and I don't know the answer to this question, it is like a communication or social frontier. Response diversity is key. Some countries, China is going to pursue nuclear if we don't. Um, it's in the mix. Uh, my wife and I disagree about nuclear. We live eight miles from Indian Point, you know, and but we love each other. <laughs> so how do you how do you like how can we have a, co a conversation? How can we build policy where where if you're dug in on policy A and the other person who wants to solve the climate problem is dug in on policy C? How can you acknowledge each other's positions and right. still pursue acknowledge diversity and still pursue progress? And that that's like I don't know I don't know how that happens. I mean, it's funny because it ends up being this situation in which you kind of walk all the way through these different domains of knowledge where it's like you're first you're in physics and then you're in yeah. right, then you're in international relations and then you're in political theory and then you're in cultural cognition, your social theory. And then you end up in this sort of like it almost feels like you end up in this kind of. I don't want to say spiritual place, but like a place of like collective consciousness and an existential question about what the human species is. Oh, yeah. And I... I, it, it, I mean, this is... this is It's an existential test yeah. about what the human species is and what the human species is capable of. That's what we face. And, and you've led to one of my other big insights, which came... You know, I was a science writer for 30-whatever years. And in 2014, I went to the Vatican to a big meeting called Sustainable Humanity, Sustainable Planet, Our Responsibility. And it was the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Uh, I got to spend a week there. I was, I, was the, I was the rapporteur, like the respondent or whatever. And I was surrounded by geniuses. So I turned to Walter Monk, this, this unbelievable oceanographer from Scripps, after dinner, you know, in, um, wine. And I said, so Walter, what do you think is going to get us through this century? And here he is at 96. And he's a physical oceanographer, not even like a cool fish guy. He's like all about numbers. And he, he, he turned to me and he said, it'll take a miracle of love and unselfishness. Hmm. And that, 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 I mean, my hair almost prickled. It literally, I was, you know, scribbling. And uh, I've had more than, I'd say, half a dozen conversations with people who really understand the, this issue in the most profound way. And they all end up saying, I don't know, but they're working on it anyway. Right. And that's, that's like this weird thing because, you know, everyone has position, you're staked around knowledge, it's all greenhouse gases and gigatons and, and megawatts um, and make, it's sort of acknowledging that we don't know is, is I think, important. Not just because of the uncertainty, but it's just the fundamental reality of this, this, this thing. Uh, we're going to get through, I think, I think, I believe, with, you know, those words get all mixed up. I wake up in the morning kind of optimistic, and I usually go to bed kind of sapped. But I wake up in the morning oh. optimistic and go to bed sapped. And you know, my favorite, on. my favorite piece of writing is uh, Camus' Myth of Sisyphus, which is about an eternal pointless struggle, right? Sisyphus wakes up every day, he rolls a rock up the hill, it rolls back down. And the 
the point of the essay, which is a kind of real touchstone for me and how I think about life uh, and whatever kind of personal theology I have, or sort of anti-theology, I think, <laughs> Camus is an atheist, is that you know, it's the process, not the outcome. There, there's, there's something you have to, you put faith in the process or the joy of the task or the struggle of the rolling of the rock. Yeah. And the last line of the essay is, um, you know, one imagines Sisyphus happy. And that's the way I think I think about, <laughs> yeah. about this, uh, wicked problem. Andy Revkin seems like a happy guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's a happy guy. I mean, he doesn't well, I'm, have a, I'm a musician on the side. He's a musician on the side. He no longer has a mullet. He's got a tw- <laughs> He's 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 got a little gray inflected in his beard. He's the author of four books. Um, he is the strategic advisor for media innovation at the National Geographic Society. He was at the New York Times for years. Um, he is uh, one of the central chroniclers of this problem over the course of three decades. It's been a, a great pleasure to have you here. It's an honor. Thank you. So I want to thank again Andy Revkin for coming on the program. I learned a ton from him. As I said in the opening, uh, all those articles that we talked about on the show are available at NBCNews.com slash why is this happening. Uh, we upload all our stuff there. Also, as always, we love to hear from you. We've been getting great, great emails and tweets and feedback. We love hearing from people that are listening to the show. It means a lot to us who work on this to hear how much you're enjoying it and how seriously you're taking it and how much it's inspiring questions uh, from you. You can always tweet about the podcast using the hashtag withpod, withpod, with being an acronym for why is this happening? Not like I'm with pod as in like those like t-shirts, like I'm with stupid with the arrow. Like it's not like that. It's not I'm with pod. It's with pod as in why is this happening pod? With pod, or you can also email us at uh, withpod at gmail.com. Um, speaking of email, we got an email uh, from a listener, Brian, who is reacting to the conversation I had with Nicole Hannah Jones about school segregation and desegregation, which I would say is probably the conversation we've gotten the most feedback on. Uh, lots of folks tweeting at us and sending us emails about that conversation. Uh, and thanks again to Nicole, who who is really a remarkable person to listen to on this. Um, Brian says, could we not just distribute the property taxes that go toward public school funding evenly across all schools? Otherwise, the best schools are always going to be where the wealthiest people are living and vice versa. Rather than move kids around, why not move money? Uh, Why is funding tethered to housing and proximity to school X? And why can't we break that link? It's a great question. The fact of the matter is he is correct that the the system of school funding we have in the U.S. is crazy and builds in a lot of inequity because it's funded by property taxes and property taxes correlate to home value and home value correlates to the wealth and affluence of the area. And so what you get are affluent areas that really fund their schools and poor areas that don't. And it is the case that other places don't do that. And it would almost certainly make for a more equitable education system if we unlinked property taxes and school funding and found a way to fund them differently. State income tax, for instance, or something like that. That said, you can imagine a universe in which we do delink property taxes and school funding and we still have segregated schools. Because as long as you have school districts, even if the money and resources um, are more equitably distributed, you can still have the same dynamics that produce the kinds of uh, segregation that Nicole and I talked about. So thanks to Brian for uh, sending in that email. And again, uh, hit us up with email with pot at gmail.com. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team, music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work from Why Is This Happening, including links to things we mentioned here by going to NBCNews.com slash Why Is This Happening.